This podcast is part of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed may not reflect those of other podcasts or affiliates of this show or Gunna Geek. Check out other geeky podcasts at GunnaGeek.com. And get ready because geekiness commences in three... Two, one. So I actually, actually, I was thinking instead of doing a podcast, what we could do is a podcast overdrive. Hey, when you ripple, you gotta ripple good. <laughs> when you ripple, you've gotta ripple good. Yellow sunlight podcast. Basically, one of the best quotes you could possibly use to open a podcast with, by the way. If you're going to ripple, ripple good. (laughs) I like that a lot. Speaking of which, we should probably officially start, although we don't really have an official start. I mean, I have a theme song, but that's, we don't, like, we don't do that live every week. Okay, I wondered about that, if that was just post or not. Oh, everything is post. Everything <laughs> is post. Why do you think we all sound so good? <laughs> Just yep. kidding, we don't. Uh, hey, listener, I'd like to acknowledge you because you're now listening to me and Guy, our special guest. And by our, I mean mine because John's not here this week because he has a family. Oh. I know. No, John is... What is John doing? John has a baby and... As I texted him, he officially has an excuse to get out of anything he wants to for the next mm, 20 plus years of his life. A baby's a good cover all excuse for just about anything. It really is. So John is off doing some family things, and he said he he gave me his blessing. He was like, well, we were going to do a podcast with Guy, right? So why don't you just do it and Guy can fill in for me? And then I'll be back next week to ruin everything. Those were his exact words. (laughs) Exact words. Oh, he's going to just drown you in baby stories. He'll have a million of them in the next three days. uh, He has a million of them every day, and that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. That's what babies are for, making stories. Not not growing up, just just the stories. Yeah, not now. Whatever. That's pretty much (laughs) it. Um, And, uh, listen, a guy is dangerously qualified to be on this podcast. I am Uh, vaguely qualified. I give the illusion and essence of being qualified without actually being qualified. All right, now, how many years did you work at GameStop? Uh, Six going on seven, if I'm not mistaken. That is pretty qualified. It was quite a while, but but most people, including probably some of the listeners, will attest that not everybody who works at a GameStop should be qualified to know, talk about, or claim any knowledge on video games as a whole. Really? I thought they only hired video game experts there. That's the idea, but I can tell you from my personal experiences before and after I worked at GameStop, not always the case. Hmm. There are a lot of people who go there just because, I mean, you'll make no mistake, listeners, if you have any illusions, make no mistake, GameStop is not a day-in, day-out, video game-centric job. As much as it is a standard retail job where you kind of, sort of sell magazines, DLC, and occasionally a video game. Yeah, but video games. It is a bit more entrenched, and I mean, there are some exceptions to the rule. Like, you know, if you're a manager and you go to the annual manager's conference in in Las Vegas, (laughs) almost said New Vegas, they do get hands-on. I mean, it's pretty much like a pre-E3, E3 for the managers. They get hands-on with early builds of all the new hardware concepts and videos. They get hands-on with new games that are probably in just late beta or even late alpha in some cases. Damn, son. I know, just, it's off. Oh, I would love to go, but... Uh, I've... I had my time with GameStop. It's done enough. Yes! Yes, everyone must open a new chapter in their lives. Uh, and now look at you. Now look at you. You've been reduced to co-hosting podcasts with me. <laughs> Guest co-hosting. Guest <laughs> even worse. You've been reduced to guest co-hosting a video game podcast whose premise is that the hosts are not qualified to talk about what they're <laughs> talking about. Whew. 
Yeah, but it's a lot like working at GameStop. You do it for the love, not for the money. God, never <laughs> for the money. Well, <laughs> that said, I don't want to continue belaboring and talking so much about your old job because that's no fun. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> although I'm sure we'll bring it up at some point because I'd, I'd like to provide some semblance of structure to the listener since last week's episode started on a tangent, then went off on a tangent, and then I think an hour ish <laughs> into the episode, we kind of talked about a uh, game ish. And my count, it was about 25 to 30 minutes before you actually got to the subject of games, if I don't... Yes! <laughs> so, so what we, what I do really like to do... Well, what we, so what I usually do is I, I ask on Google+, Plus, hey, listener, what did you play over the weekend? And then mm. I read off what the listener played, and John has usually heard of 80 to 90% of the games listed, and I've heard of maybe three of them mm. ever... I, I was still just mind blown. You had no idea what the Elder Scrolls Online was. Okay, I knew it. I, okay, I knew. I know Elder Scrolls. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know the acronym ESO. Okay. So, but T yeah, you're right, T E S O technically I, is oh so oh, well see and I I don't. <laughs> look, my qualifications aside, <laughs> I'm guessing. Roughly the same thing will happen now since you used to sell video games or or be at a place that sold video games, mm-hmm. as as you would put it. So only a few listeners replied this week because I attached my question to some weird picture of an old person using an Imperial Walker as a walker. Yes, I love that picture. Yeah, it was a little awkward. So uh, not as much response, but we'll just go through a, a couple games our listeners have been playing uh, so that we so that I at least I appear somewhat in touch even though I just explained that I'm not. <laughs> and you will help raise the bar. So uh, Kieran has been playing Arma 2 mostly, but dipping into a bit of Mount and Blade right now. We'll probably boot up Skyrim at some point, still yet to play any of the DLC content. All right, so what's Arma 2? Arma 2 is a large-scale first-person shooter military simulation. It's very broad, and it can be very mod-heavy. Um, a lot of people do use mods with it. Picture something on the scale of Battlefield, but to the nth degree. Like, you know how big Battlefield is compared to how Call of Duty is, where a single map would form, like, a ninth of the size of one of the smaller maps in Battlefield? Arma goes even wider. Okay. So, did have you ever, so you've played Battlefield, I'm guessing. Yes. I've never touched the Battlefield series, mm. which is kind of sad. Uh, now, listener, th- for some background, I used to play, I, I got into Call of Duty because of Guy, mm-hmm. and we used to play with Guy's friends at GameStop, and y- those guys were, you guys were so good, it was, it was, it was so, oh god. I, like, I felt bad whenever we had to invite you or anyone else. People actually got to the point where they'd ask, they wouldn't say, oh, you guys are online. It would be, do you have a spot on the team? Oh, yeah, I I could barely get in. I mean, because there were six or seven of you who were very elite level, and then a few of us who were there, and we'd fill a spot if you needed one. Mm -hmm. I I witnessed several games in which the final score was 100 to 20, or maybe 100 to 23, (laughs) often 100 to 30. I mean, that's literally is true because you guys were so ridiculously good and i'm i'm sure half of the opponent's kills were probably me so you you were like in this elite like rain man class i wouldn't of... say we were elite you know it, it's not like we were a touring team or like you know old top tier players from like cs 1.6 or something but i think you could have been uh... you? <laughs> yes we could quit our day jobs at gamestop and make a living that way God, I wish. No, we were we were better than average. I can tell you, it was always amazing around any big holiday, or especially Christmas, there would be an influx of new people that would just pick up the game after we'd been playing it, you know, practically nightly for months on end. And, I mean, just it was a feeding frenzy. It would just be this huge influx of people that were just absolutely awful or had no idea what they were doing, and it was just free kills everywhere, left and right. <laughs> Oh, it was yeah. amazing. KDs would jump like an entire, if not an extra, like 50%, a lot. A lot yeah. of points. Yeah, your KD reaches were pretty ridiculous. All right, so then Battlefield is a much bigger game, and then Arma is a gigantic game. 
that sounds kind of fun. I, if I ever get back into the... See, I actually bought Call of Duty Ghosts, but it doesn't run on my PC. Because I, I remember the saga. Because <laughs> I don't understand computers, apparently. So... That sucks, but if I ever pick up a console first-person shooter again, which is seeming more and more unlikely mm. the further and further away I get from the idea of buying a PS4 or Xbox One, then I will perhaps try one of those games. And I've never, I've never heard of Mount and Blade. Mount and Blade is a medieval combat simulator. I believe it's primarily first-person, and I think you can scale back into third if I remember correctly. Picture something like the PvP from Dark Souls or Demon Souls or Dark Souls 2, but a little more okay. focused and a little broader. Okay, I was picturing it. That's what I was doing right there. Okay. So that was. Okay. All right, well, Miles has been playing The Last of Us, Left Behind, Star Wars Battlefront on PSP, and some Minecraft. I've heard of all of those! <laughs> You're qualified <laughs> to comment on this. I am! I, you know, I'm, I think... That to save money, I am just going to sit around one night drinking by myself, as I am wont to do, and watch The Last of Us Left Behind on YouTube. Have you Instead actually of... played The Last of Us yet? Oh, yeah, I played The Last of Us. Okay. That, guy, that was my game of the year, 2013. That's true. That is true. I remember you telling me that, what, last weekend, now that I think about it? <laughs> I'm crushed <laughs> that oh, you forgot. I'm so sorry. You know my memory's terrible. Oh, well, with certain things, and yeah. then with anything video game or Japanese related, you seem to be like a sponge. Yeah, I'm a little absorbent. You have you have video game overdrive! <laughs> but <laughs> Listen, only, no, only just... around vampires. Only around Listen, vampires. Okay, that's true, that's true. Listen, we'll explain that reference in a minute. And vintage gamer Charlie has been playing Super Meat Boy, Lost Odyssey, and some Lightning Returns. Ooh, <laughs> Lightning Returns. Oh, boy. I haven't touched that one at all. I still haven't started 13. I think I just played the demos of 13 and 13 too, and never actually got around to picking them up. You have a PS3? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I have a PS3 for probably going on three years now. Dude, I told Dude, you, I was right. looking at a stack of PS3 games in my backlog there. That's true. You literally told me that less than 15 minutes ago. See, and we I both forgot. have horrible short-term memory. <laughs> it's true. Well, usually in John's case, it's because I just don't listen to him. Yeah. But, so, so there's that. <laughs> a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, will, I can lend you the first two Final Fantasy 13 games at some point. Okay. And if you want Lightning Returns, oh boy. <laughs> I posted a screenshot of a text conversation I had with John earlier about Lightning Returns, and I was I was not really in a good mood at that point in my playing experience. Yeah, but wh what's your last word there, Bonesvelza? Uh, Bonevelza, Bonevelza. I, however, have since the middle of this afternoon somewhat changed my mind about the game so i'll get into that probably next week because of course i refuse to review a game until i finish it and i'm, I'm nearing the end so but i i did say earlier today that i hate the game and i no longer hate the game okay so it's like a very dysfunctional relationship it's i'm not sure how to put it i mean there's a lot of games like that where people will say the first chunk is a slog. The first wasn't the first Final Fantasy thirteen like that, where people said, oh, you know, first... oh, it's a corridor. You just go from point A to point B for the first five six hours, and then it opens up, and it's amazing, and you love it. Twenty twenty hours. Twenty hours. Wow, I was way off base. <laughs> <laughs> five or six would be realistic, guy. Come on, that, that's <laughs> what I remember hearing. But I mean, there's yeah. a there's a big argument. Actually, I remember seeing an article earlier this week, where I think it was at GDC this last week, they were talking about the fact that most gamers nowadays, the statistics are staggering. How many people actually finish games versus how many people just kind of play and put it down and move to another one and never come back to it. So there was a big discussion about, you know, talking to creators, developers, why shouldn't we put all the real meat and potato, you know, instead of having the full three-course meal first, why not put the dessert at the front of the game so gamers can truly appreciate and enjoy the best parts of the game? 
at the beginning because that's all they're realistically going to play. That makes sense. I mean, that's what turned me off to The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for so long, which Mm. ended up being one of my games of the year last year. But the first couple hours are terrible. You just have to slog through it. But and but how many TV shows are there like that? A lot. I mean, a lot of mediums, not just TV shows, a lot of novels, a lot of movies. And you have to consider if they do something like that, what are they going to do with the rest of the game? Because there are people out there who are going to play through the whole thing, if not for achievements and trophies or, you know, EP rights or just to talk to their friends without spoilers. Spoiler alert! Yeah, what are they going to do with the rest of the game? If they seriously try to put the climax at the outset of the game, are they just going to pad the rest with some kind of filler? It'd be like DBZ, they get off Namek in the first three episodes, and then the rest is a flashback up to that point. Oh, that would be great. That would Wouldn't be... that be crazy if they released a video <laughs> game where you start with all the abilities and then lose them right away and then have to get them back throughout the castle? What? <laughs> like Symphony of the Night. <laughs> Wait, did, did I... I didn't... What you, I don't know what you're talking about. I know what I you're implying. I know what you're I, thinking of. I don't, none of that. <laughs> and, I don't know, Metroid Prime? I think that happens. Well, what's the... What was the most recent one? Um, the Wii, the Wii only one. After Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Other M. Other M. Wasn't that the case where the game opened up where you could do everything and then Samus has to ask permission from her commander in the field... To use her various abilities and tools in her suit. Yeah, how is that not realistic? You talk as if that's a stretch. It's not that it's... I'm not arguing the realism or lack of realism or the fact it was basically used as a narrative device to move the game along and pace it. It's just that everybody's arguing, you know, well, what's the point in a Metroid game if you literally start off with everything? You know, think about when you were talking about the speedrun back when they had, you know, the... Great game, great games done quickly. The cancer one, like, sorry, awesome I, games done also quick. AGDQ. AGDQ. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know what's the point of even having the speed run? Where in the speed runs, people have to decide over time. You know, do I need this upgrade? Do I need these e tanks? Am I going to need these extra missiles or super bombs? It kind of takes part of it out of it. You know, if you started with the full thing, the speed run would be that much more. It'd be less interesting because it would literally just be human error. You know, it takes out variables. Yeah, I can see that. I, I don't. I mean, were they, were they literally saying at GDC that they should put the like the crazy advanced parts at the start of the game? It was kind of an argument to that degree. Obviously, I did. You know, I wasn't there. I didn't hear the whole panel and discussion on it. But that was the gist I got from most of the articles I read. And I mean, I can understand they think gamers have shorter attention spans nowadays. But it's <laughs> unless you're making your game super short. Why? Why even bother doing that? Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. This this discussion is outside of my realm of expertise, certainly. Well, it's it's worth arguing, and it's worth looking at seeing as game mechanics working from the point of view of should we put the climax at the outset, or do we make it more towards the end? But I I don't want to see it become a major trend. I have a feeling it would have a very negative impact on the industry as a whole if they did. Well, here, here's my inherent problem with that. Okay. Now, now, we've opened up the can of worms. Let's go here. No, no, go we'll, ahead. Ev- we'll eventually get to what Christopher played this weekend. But <laughs> the thing is, what I've learned a lot, actually, from playing Lightning Returns okay. is there are a lot of fetch quests in this game. Like, a lot. Like, MMO level? No, uh, not quite, but there are a lot of fetch quests. And okay. Listener, if you don't know what a fetch quest is then, well, thank God someone's more qualified than we are. <laughs> but a fetch quest is basically someone says, oh, yes, I'll give you this item, but first I lost my bunny rabbit and I need to find him. And then you have to, like, run somewhere or kill a monster to get the stupid thing and then bring it back to him. You're fetching something for somebody. It's a, it's a, it's a like, it's an archetype of video games. It has be- it has become an archetype. <laughs> I mean, it's a trope. It's definitely yeah. a trope. Okay. So, anyway, I'm doing Lightning Returns, and I, I, I hit this wall where it actually didn't start slow. It started fine. The pacing was fine, but I reached a point where I, for lack of 
for so without getting into a ton of detail, I kind of hit a point where I was stuck a little bit. I didn't really know what to do, where to go, that kind of a thing. And then I just started using an FAQ online, and I started to just figure out how to do these fetch quests from that. And that's when my opinion of the game... So when I hit that wall, that's when I texted John and said that I hate this game. And then I just started using a guide and started going through it, and a little bit of it was monotonous, but at the end of the day, I looked back and I was like, hey, I could check all these things off my list. Let's say out of 30 side quests, suddenly I had done 15 or 20 of them. And I I thought to myself, oh, that's really great. So my point is what's inherently enjoyable about almost any video game you get is that sense of progression. And that's not just linear progression through the levels. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, anytime you get a power up and, and become more powerful. Although I guess NES games didn't do that. Some did. Now that I think about it. Some well, did. But, but, and, and certainly some did, but some, but a lot of games do that now, and a lot didn't back then. Mm-hmm. Like Super Mario Brothers. You, you get a star or a mushroom or a flower, but then it goes away if you get hit, and then there you go. And they're available from the outset. It's not something that appears over time as you progress. You know, say you were leveling up, it's always there somewhere in a level. Oh my gosh. I, did we just unearth Mario Bro- Super Mario Brothers is the perfectly designed video game? <laughs> there are a lot of people that put it on that pedestal. But, I mean, if you think about it, that's, that's exactly how you accomplish what they're talking about at GDC. You give them everything at the outset. Everything is available immediately at the outset. Mm. and But it can get taken away from you easily. And then you have to earn it back. In a way, but part of that's also, it wasn't just abilities and upgrades and things. You also have to consider the different worlds and Super Mario Brothers and, you know, Super Mario Brothers 3. It's not just, you know, say, like, take Super Mario Brothers 3, for instance. A lot of people also consider that to be quite possibly, you know, the pinnacle of game design and well-designed sure. games. And it's not just that everything's available from the start, but you go to all the different worlds, and the different worlds have different themes to them. You know, you have Giant World, you have the Ice World, but then within those worlds, you also have unique power-ups and things that don't appear at the beginning or don't appear throughout the entire game. Tanuki's, you know, you have the Tanuki suit, you have Karibo's boot, the Hammer Brother suit, which is only available in World 6, I think it is? I don't even know. I just know it's awesome. It is awesome, and I wish they would... Use it more often, but that's eh, all about it. Interesting. This conversation has been enlightening. Mm-hmm. But we still Too have yet J- to get to what Christopher's playing. I know. That's true. Too bad John doesn't listen to this podcast, so he'll never hear it. <laughs> <sighs> He's oh, well. listening to baby monitors. That's true. And on the plus side, it because he doesn't listen to this podcast, that means he missed the Ryan episode. So he at least saved himself that hour of, of sanity. I think you're going to look back someday fondly on that episode. <laughs> Maybe yeah, after you've been drinking for a while, but you will <laughs> come to say, appreciate it in time. I was going to say, I may get really drunk sometime. You never know. Hmm. Well, Christopher has been playing a lot of things. He posted Friday, I think, ish. Something happened and his parents were going to let him have like a video game party, but a retro video game party. Oh, okay. Which, which is, I think, which gives me hope for the youth of the, the youth of America that they didn't just have like that they didn't play some I don't know name a name a game that's popular with the kids Call of Duty. Yeah, that they didn't have some Call of Duty tournament. I mean, that's fine or whatever, but you do that on the internet. So, mm. so the old school that's awesome. So here's what he played this weekend. I'll get you my uh, let's see, blah blah blah. Uh, here we go. Laundry list of games. I couldn't read there for a second. <laughs> for the original PlayStation. He played Tekken 3, Crash Bandicoot, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, Lego Island 2, and Gran Turismo. That, I support all of those. That is an incredible cross-section for the PS1. <laughs> that is right? absolutely fantastic, and I'm glad that someone younger could go back and appreciate those. Especially considering that they say the 32-bit, that whole generation, is going to be the single worst to age over time. You know, you go, back, you go back and you look at PS1 graphics or something on the Saturn, and it can look just absolutely muddy and atrocious. That's true. I mean, even Final Fantasy VII. 
pretty bad. Did <laughs> did not age well. Final Fantasy VI aged better than Final Fantasy VII mm. by like a lot. Oh so yeah. I, yeah, yeah. So good for you. And also on the Nintendo Entertainment System, mm. he played Shalom. Shalom. Oh, I never heard of that one. Oh wait, Slalom. Oh okay. <laughs> Gonna say Shalom. Is that a Wisdom Tree game? I, I, I don't see Nintendo of America approving a game called Shalom. Hey, you never know. There were un, there was all those unlicensed games. You got Tangan, like I said, the Wisdom Tree games. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What is Slalom though? Slalom. I think that was one that also had an arcade release where you could actually play on a stand-up pair of skis, and you actually had the running poles that you could lean on the machine, and it was literally racing down a ski slope and avoiding trees and obstacles. That's crazy. And it was kind of a pseudo 2D, 3D, the way it had a... I can't remember the exact name for it, but it's a style of the older 2D, 2D games, a lot like uh, The Hang-On or, you know, Outrun, um, Space Harrier, where basically you have static images in the foreground... And then the background, it looks like everything's coming at you. So it's almost like an on-rails game. Yeah, yeah. But you still have control in the 2D plane over your character. I can't believe I've never heard of a semi-3D, 2D Jewish skiing game. You know, the only reason I know Slalom off the top of my head is they actually... If they had one of the arcade units, if it's the one I'm thinking of, at the Chuck E. Cheese on East State when we were kids. <laughs> really? Yeah. Good. Well, okay. I, sorry, I got sidetracked on Slalom, but he's also <laughs> was playing Gauntlet 2. Mm, classic. Classic. Super, yeah, Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers 2, Super Mario Brothers 3, Tecmo Super Bowl, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Tetris, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, and Pinball. I approve of all of those. It's a slow clap right there. Oh, I'll give him a regular clap. <laughs> And then the morning after I played all those games, yes, I played them all in a night, I played some Minecraft on the Xbox 360 and Halo 3, then my friends came over and I played Super Smash Bros. Melee and Project M, mm. and while I'm writing this, I'm about to go on a trip, which will have me playing Picross 3D, Puzzle Quest, Mario Kart DS, Pokemon Fire Red, and Dragon Quest 9. Christopher, I have to say you have absolutely fantastic taste in games. Not yeah. only individual titles, but the scope as well. Yeah, seriously, that's a that's a bit of variety there. I like that. That is a fantastic cross section. That is awesome. And I heard from so Christopher's actually our listener that was involved in a robotics competition that we that I I posted about on Google Plus a few weekends ago, oh. and apparently some results came in and he did well. So I'm gonna maybe we'll share any updates on that on Google Plus. But that's awesome. So our listeners. More successful people than me. <laughs> and me. Uh, <laughs> sure. Okay. I'll let you in just so that we have the solidarity. Mm. And uh, we are su- also... So let's get to know Guy a little bit more, listener. Are you ready for this? Listener, do you have a fireplace crackling in front of your YouTube? Are you sitting down with a, a fine glass of Merlot? Or perhaps <laughs> some Chardonnay? Or... Perhaps a pennant, Grigio, maybe. Just saddle up. Saddle up in your horse chairs. Don't know what that is, but now you have one. Saddle up in your horse chair, and now we'll get to know Guy. That was a weird voice. I like it. It made me feel, uh, I feel like I should be presenting for Masterpiece Theater. (laughs) I should feel very much more dignified than I am as I recount and regale you with tales of my past, gaming glories... Yes, yes. Verily, indubitably, in fact. Honestly, I don't know where to begin other than... I suppose the defining thing that set me on the course for loving video games for life, as you may or may not recall, Cody, because I have known Cody and John for many, many years. I've known Cody since first grade, and we are now old, old men. But I digress. When I was growing up, I was the kid with the TurboGrafx-16. Oh my god, that's right! Oh my god! How did I not plan on talking about... I was just going to ask you what how your weekend was. Oh, how, okay. We, 
Oh, no, no. We would be remiss <laughs> to fail to mention that in first grade, I was friends with this kid named Guy who had a TurboGrafx-16, which no one owned. And most of the, our listeners, many of our listeners probably haven't even heard of the TurboGrafx-16. By that name, I'm guessing not. I do know there's a lot more widespread now via emulation and especially... The virtual console. The fact that right. Hudson was able to actually... Well, Hudson and NEC, I'm actually not entirely sure who even owns the rights to the PC engine. and Because Hudson's owned by Konami, and then Konami dissolved them about a year ago. But regardless, the virtual console and emulation has gotten a lot of people to come to appreciate and discover that it existed. The TurboGrafx-16, or it was known overseas, where it was far more successful, the PC engine and later the PC Engine Duo. I, Got it. So I grew up, all the other kids I knew, they loved Mario or they loved Sonic. I grew up with Bonk. They grew up with, you know, RPGs or various other platformers types of games. I grew up with vertical and horizontal shooters. It was very formative to my early years. Gave me a lifelong, lifelong love of shoot 'em ups and just giving consoles a shot that most people either didn't love or didn't give enough of a fair shake, I think. I know I love shooters. Oh, I love shooters. I'm god-awful at them, you know. I'm no Don Maku expert. I couldn't make a video. I still, to this day, don't think I've ever actually finished Ikaruga, even though I've owned it on three different platforms. Yes, Ikaruga, one of the hardest games. Actually, is it even in the harder tier of... Not really, games? not really, not once you get into, like, Mushihime Sama Futari, uh, any of the Dodonpachis, the Black Labels, any of the Toho Project, basically anything that could fall under Don Maku, or what's known as Bullet Curtain or Bullet Hell Shooters. Yes. It's yes. not really that close or difficult compared to them. It does have the unique mechanic with the color shifting, but even that's been done with other games a little more difficultly, or... I don't want to say handled better, but kind of in a retrospective view, maybe a little more unique. good example would be like Mars Matrix, which was on the Dreamcast, and I believe was a CPS 2 or CPS 3 release. Might have been Naomi in the arcades. CPS? Capcom Play System. That's a thing? Oh yeah. Well, alright, remember I was talking about Slalom in the arcade. Nintendo had a specific arcade board that actually used NES cartridges, or you'd have other games that would be ported to the NES. A good example would be, uh, you were talking about Chris was playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I was wondering if he was talking about the first one, which is nigh impossible and has completely bullshit electric jellyfish and seaweed, or yeah. if he was talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, which was released on the old, I think it was either Konami system or it may have just been a straight jam aboard. But it had the port to the NES that was good, but not perfect. Another one would be uh, Sunset Riders. Had a release, I believe, on the Genesis and the Super NES, but the arcade version was still, you know, it was prettier, it had better voices and everything. Well, just like that, Capcom had an entire set of boards that were separate, because the industry standard for most arcade games, for our generation at least, Cody, and going back a little bit further, used a system that was called JAMMA, J-A-M-M-A. And it was kind of a unified, you had the board, and then you would get PCBs, you know, printed circuit boards. They were basically like giant cartridges you would plug into the system. Now, there's other systems that ran parallel, such as the Neo Geo had the MVS, the multi-video system. And how that worked was those were basically giant cartridges that fit into a slotted board. You know, you'd always see the big red MVS arcade machines in any given arcade, and some of them would have one game, and other ones would have a button that would say select game. And you could cycle through, uh, usually it'd be a two or four slot, so you'd have, you know, two or four games. Yeah, like the SNK machines that had Samurai Showdown. Exactly, and... that, that, those were MVSs. Now, Capcom had its own system, I mean, the early, early stuff like uh, Makai Mura, the old, like, Ghosts and Goblins, and the really older stuff, came before CPS 2, I think that was actually CPS 1, from, like, Volgus forward. But once you get to the era of Final Fight and Street Fighter 2... All the way up to the very early, like, early Dreamcast, late PlayStation 1 era. It was called CPS 2, which was Capcom Play System 2. And again, there were these shelled boards that you would just plug in on the inside of the machine. And it would already have an interface for all the different games. So you just switch out the individual game inside the machine. 
instead of having to get a whole separate machine. And I mean, like the Dungeons and Dragons beat 'em ups, Aliens vs. Predator, Street Fighter 2, Final Fight, Darkstalkers, a lot of their vertical and horizontal shooters, although they really didn't license too many of those, were all CPS 2. And then their later board was CPS 3. CPS 3 didn't really jump off as much because the arcade scene was kind of dying here. It still has a lot of lauded love overseas, and for collectors it still has a lot of love, but uh, a good example would be Street Fighter 3 when that came out. Um, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the fighting game they made, Heritage for the Future, were a big deal when they came out because it showcased more layers and graphics and sound that they couldn't do with the CPS 2. It was a full hardware upgrade, but it still kept the same modularity. So is it backwards compatible? No, no. You, I believe you cannot play CPS 2 on CPS 3 without having another... You have to have either a separate board on top of the games, or you have to have just entirely separate connections. Okay, and CPS and CPS 2 are also not compatible with each other? That I'm not sure on. That I would have to look up. Unfortunately, as much as I <laughs> wish I were an arcade historian, I'm very not well-versed on the hardware side as far as that. I would imagine not, though. Uh, you sounded hella qualified, right? Th- th- this is exactly why I wanted you to guest host this podcast. Oh, and if you didn't know, um, Cody, speaking of Dreamcast, the Dreamcast was actually a consolized version of the Naomi board, which is what Sega used throughout that entire generation as well. Uh, all right. This is this knowledge. Stop. You sound so... Like, you know what you're talking. This is unacceptable. <laughs> I'm going to look even... See, because... Now you're going to have to change the name of the podcast to Overqualified. Oh, my God. Seriously. Well, so, because mo- I think you may not be a historian. How many different times... How many ways can I start this sentence? <laughs> how many was that right there? Like, that was so many different attempts to start a sentence. That's how discombobulated you have me from that. And... When you say, like, you're not an arcade historian, most people would have said, because this whole tangent came across me asking what CPS is, because you said that a particular shooter was available on Dreamcast and CPS 1 and CPS 2. And then I said... I think, was actually on the Naomi board. It wasn't on CPS. Well, what was the game you were talking about? Was it Ikaruga? No, No, it wasn't. We were talking about Mars Matrix. Mars Matrix. Yes. Which, if I remember correctly, was CPS 3. Okay, so Mars Matrix, you said, was available for Dreamcast and CPS, and then I said, what CPS? And then you talked about the board. Most people, to my knowledge, like me, most most amateur gamers like myself or John, we would have said it was available for, for Dreamcast and Arcade. I stand corrected. Uh, I just looked it up on Wikipedia, and Mars Matrix actually was a CPS2 board. CPS? But see, <laughs> therein lies... Your specificity, which I applaud you for. You you don't just say arcade. Like, for me, it's, oh, it was available on PlayStation and arcade. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know the boards. You have a knowledge of what is inside of those big, glorious, beautiful cabinets. And that is what, that that threw me off, which is fantastical. But the CPS, to be clear, is not a home console system. Although, see, now we're getting into a tricky area here. Modern collecting has led to not just people, you know, buying arcade machines and keeping them at home, putting them in their homes, but there's also a style of what's called either consolized or usually more adeptly called super guns. And super guns can be made for almost any console or arcade board, where they actually do make a consolized version of the arcade board that you just plug into your TV or monitor, however you want to hook it up. And it has regular, you know, you can do RGB, S cart. Uh, composite is real common nowadays. So you actually can get a consoleized, like, around the size of an Xbox 360, one of the slim ones, that would play arcade boards. I want one. You can have one, if you want to pay for it. Oh, are they super expensive? Not prohibitively. Um, not usually, especially... The thing is, you'll have to understand, well, one, you could just buy, you know, a PC and just set it up to be a dedicated MAME machine, you know, M-A-M-E, and just run it that way, because main Wait, supports... Sand, sand, what does it stand for again? Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator, which it's called it. because it supports JAMA, MVS, CPS2, CPS3, and many other boards. And you can... The next time you load MAME... Have you ever used MAME? I'm sure you've had it installed on something, but... I actually have a MAME emulator on my Wii, 
but it is it prohibit prohibitively restrictive. No, that's I just I just wanted to use prohibitively because you used it, oh, fair and enough. you you did it better than me, so I'm not going to try. But it is very restrictive on what's compatible for it, and the only two games I got to work for it were the Simpsons arcade game and the X Men arcade game. Okay. <laughs> So there are certainly worse games to get to work, but yes, I did get that to work on my Wii. However, I've never, I, I'm not a big computer emulator guy, and I don't know why. I feel like maybe it, because it would give me too many options. It can maybe. be a bit stifling if you're not used to it, especially a MAME. MAME is, I don't want to say it's not user-friendly, but it almost requires a starter guide or like a YouTube tutorial to teach people how to use it, how to sort it, how to map controls can actually be extremely difficult. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, MAME is designed as a front... I think front-end is the right term. Where it's literally designed to run almost anything you can actually get a ROM for. ROM, obviously, being read-only memory, or as far as we understand it, in terms of common emulation speak, a copy of the game. Right. As an actual file or set of files as opposed to having a hard copy. Now, the problem is MAME is actually set up... I mean, you can set it up to work with light guns. You can set it to work with trackball or, like, rotary stick games like Time Soldier or Forgotten Worlds. It's, I remember... Do you remember back on eBay back in, I want to say, circa, like, 02, 03-ish, maybe a little later? People used to sell, I think they called them, like, Super Arcade or Super X Arcade sticks. And they were always these big, like, laptop set arcade sticks that would have two sticks and two sets of, like, six buttons, maybe two more. And it would have a trackball in the middle. Yeah, that's, I think you remember that. That's basically what they were designed and sold for, was for people to set up either MAME cabinets or use with a PC running MAME to support all the types of games. So, you mentioned... There's so many questions right now. So, you mentioned TurboGrafx-16. Yes. Going back to the kind of the original thing, that there were a lot of shooters. Now, the only thing I knew existed for TurboGrafx-16 was Bonk. Mm -hmm. Because if you were a kid growing up, listener, if you if you weren't this, then this is what you missed. If you were a kid growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, all the TV commercials, there was Mario on Nintendo, there was Sonic on Sega, and there was Bonk from TurboGrafx-16. Was that a Neo Geo property? Hudson, actually. Uh, it was or Hudson, off. rather. It's a Hudson mm. Neo Geo, right? No, it has no ties to SNK. Um, Bonk was a property. It was a character, I believe, designed by Hudson for NEC. Because Hudson actually had a hand in, like, they didn't just make Bomberman games and, you know, games. They actually had a hand in the hardware side and development for the Turbo Graphics or technically the PC Engine. The okay, wait a minute. Did I just say. Did I just say, was it a Neo Geo... Yes, you asked if it was an SNK property. Technically, you were probably asking if it was an SNK property, which it was not. I, I, all right, because I know that question I just asked was really nonsensical. Who made the TurboGrafx-16? It was a joint venture between NEC, who I don't think is even a company anymore, if I remember correctly, and Hudson Soft. Got it. All right. Okay. I know you pretty much just said that, but I just... Because apparently I'm unable to articulate... Ideas. It can be hard to soak in if you didn't grow up with it. You know, growing up with it and then growing up away from it and looking back and finding out, you know, in the internet age where you can find out all the behind scenes stuff and the history of all the games and consoles you loved when you were a kid, it just opens so many cans of worms. It is a bit of gaming history. Do you still have it? Amber has it, actually. My sister. Really? What I like to consider the divorce when she moved out after she got out of the house here, she said she wanted the TurboGrafx-16, and I'm like, you never play it. Are you really going to use it? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to use it. I'm pretty sure it's collecting dust in either a box in her attic or it's still unhooked underneath the TV. I'm not even sure she has a TV with a coaxial input to even attach it to. Although we hmm. did have the Turbo Booster, and I still have the box. It's actually about two feet to my left which was an accessory that actually gave the PC Engine regular composite AV outs, you know, red, white, and yellow. Oh, really? So you could actually have stereo sound as well as a digital video signal, but if I remember correctly, 
I want to say the Turbo Graphics sound chip actually was mono out only, so the stereo was technically dual mono. Don't quote me on that though. I will I could never do it. would never do so. So I all I knew that existed was bonk. I did not know there were a lot of vertical and ho- and horiz- First of all, I've never liked horizontal shooters and I don't know why. They've always bothered me. I've only liked vertical shooters. I find that horizontal shooters require a lot more patience. They tend to be less a matter of and I mean, you know, historically like Gradius and R Type and Salamander and all the other various ones that have been very popular. I find that they're usually less a case of just avoiding enemies and bullets, but as much about avoiding the environment. And I think that throws a lot of people off that, you know, if you don't love just struggling to learn the perfect path and get, you know, they're definitely high score games. As far as replayability, if you've played through it, you've gotten like, say you've gotten every power up and you fought every optional boss, if there's any optional bosses, there's pretty much nothing to do, right? For a horizontal shooter? For horizontal or vertical. Okay. Well, the thing that tends to keep it alive is high scores and kind of score attacks. And it's evolved a lot more in the modern, both horizontal and first-person shooters. Actually, you, do you still have a 360? Yeah. I have a horizontal shooter you should borrow from me, and you're probably going to wonder why I'm suggesting it. Um, it was actually the first release of a cave shooter in the United States. Now, Cave is a company that's famous for making arcade shooters in Japan. Um, there's actually a joke. I'm sure you know how the Xbox 360 tended to flounder sales-wise and adoption-wise in Japan. Yeah. People like to actually jokingly call it a Cave box because they had some kind of exclusivity release with Microsoft where all the Cave shooters would only come out or they'd come out as like timed exclusives on the 360 mm. only. So literally, the only people that were buying 360s outside of people who were buying it for Idolmaster 1 when that came out, or the very small contingent who specifically loved Western, like Call of Duty and Halo, were people that were hardcore horizontal and vertical shooter fans buying it for one company. You know, it's like back in the day if you bought Nintendo or you bought, you know, PlayStation 1 or 2 for Squaresoft games. Yeah, but I was only... just gonna say they should. I should call my PSP the Dissidia SP. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very much so. Okay, interesting. But uh... the one I wanted to suggest is it's called Death Smiles. Now, Death Smiles is unique in that it is a bullet hell shooter. So we're talking like Ikaruga and worse density and patterns of bullets, and it's not quite a cue 'em up. Which listeners, if you never heard the term, there's shoot 'em ups or sometimes abbreviated as shmups for the online communities. And then there's queued em ups Now, queued em ups are a bit divergent because instead of piloting, you know, a starship or some big gross mutant bug, which was extremely vogue in the 90s, you pilot as a little girl or some kind of witch, you know, some kind of cutesy little anime something. Um, a good example would be Parodius, which is kind of not the original queued him up, but close to, I guess, I think Poppin is actually the first uh, one I can think of, which was an NES era release, but Gradius, are you familiar with Gradius at all, Cody? Oh, I, yeah, Gradius okay. is what I was specifically thinking of me not liking. Okay, well, Gradius had a spin-off series, and you should look this up, because I know you can get at least a couple of them, if not on the Virtual Console or emulated, on your PSP, I know, I think there was actually a Parodius collection, there was a side series called Parodius, you know, parody us instead of Gradius. And literally, you had, like, the Vic Viper, which is the flagship ship that you piloted in Gradius, but then you had little girls. There was a, an octopus with a pair of panties on its head. There was <laughs> Pingu, who was actually a penguin from an old, old series of Konami games, which I think one of the first ones was one of Kojima's first projects, Hideo Kojima. Good. I'd, I'd have to check with Carl on that or look it up. But the whole thing is, like, throughout the level, you're fighting just weird, grotesque, cartoonish things instead of horrible monsters. And they'd always have some stupid plot, like, you know, the octopus with the panties on his head is fighting through levels to get to a treasure trove of panties that were stolen from him or something. Good. Just, wow. Do me a favor when you get off, you know, listeners, this is optional. Cody, you have to. Go on YouTube <laughs> and just look up videos of, you know, like, one or two of the Parodius games, and you'll just... You're going to love it, trust me. I love listeners, this is optional. Cody, you have to. 
Well, I can't force them, but I can hunt you down. I know where you <laughs> That's are. That's true. That is, t- is Parodius made by the people that made Gradius? Yeah, Konami. It's actually the uh, same, dev t- same dev teams that made Gradius, if I remember correctly. Wow, okay. At and least traditionally. I can't say all of them. Every single part of this entire conversation about shooters, arcade boards, cute em ups, all of this is going to converge into one point with one specific thing I'm going to bring up after we're done talking about shooters on the TurboGrafx-16. So let's get back okay. to that first. <laughs> all right. Well, there are a number of ones that were amazing. Um, my personal favorite and what a lot of people consider to be one of the top tier ones for the basic TurboGrafx, because you also have to understand the TurboGrafx as I had it was just the system itself, which took what are called hue cards. I don't know if you've ever actually seen a PC Engine or TurboGrafx game in person. Have you? No. They're about the size of a credit card with maybe twice the thickness. And when you put it in the system, the contacts face upward. So it just has like a black surface with a row of gold contacts at the top. And at the bottom, you just have a printed label for the game. You know, like New Adventure Island, I think, actually had characters. Like it had, you know, Master Higgins yeah. on it, as well as some of the monster bosses. But then other ones like... I think Bonk's Revenge actually just said, like, Bonk's Revenge, and it had a bright neon green background. But there were also a, there was also a CD add-on. First, it was just the CD add-on, which was literally, it was like a Sega CD you would plug into the back of the system, because where the Turbo Booster attached on the system, because the Turbo Graphics itself and the PC Engine are very, very small. I mean, we're talking, like, the thickness of a PS3 Slim with the outer dimensions of a GameCube. I mean, tiny. Oh, yeah, they were weird. really small. Like, as small, if not smaller, than an NES. But the CD add-on was this monstrosity you'd plug in the back. Or, later on, they released what was known as the Turbo Duo, or PC Engine Duo, which was both the Hue Card system and the CD system slapped together in one big, gigantic unit, which was amazing. And that <laughs> had there were a lot of shooters and RPGs and things specifically only available for the CD version of the system, which Gate of Thunder and Lords of Thunder are two that are just absolutely unbelievable. Um, Super Star Soldier, absolutely unbelievable. And you can get these on the virtual console. You don't need a CD or anything because they're easily emulatable nowadays. But growing up for me, um, Cybercore was a huge one where you played as a soldier who turned into a giant mutant bug and you shot other giant mutant bugs. And it was outstanding. Um, but Blazing Lasers is kind of considered... Entry level, I'm just getting into Turbo Graphics or PC Engine, I need a good vertical shooter. You know, what, what's the game to sell me on the system that I can get in just a regular Hue card? And Blazing Lasers is always the number one answer. Like, that or Bonk's Revenge are the probably the top two that you could get either US release or Japan only. I thought Bonk's, Ad- Bonk's Adventure was the... Bonk's Adventure was the first one, and it's good. But Bonk's Revenge was much more colorful, it had a much bigger palette, um, the worlds are much more diverse, the bosses are more okay. creative, and I can tell you from childhood experience, the controls are much tighter as well. Okay, that's pretty key. That is extremely key in a platformer like that. Okay, so I had no idea there were shooters on the TurboGrafx-16. Oh yeah, and some, that's of, awesome. some of them were properties from other companies too. Um, for one, our type which was made by the IREM Corporation, who is technically not around because I think they got bought and or destroyed or dismantled by Konami, just like Hudson. But I digress. Um, Our type had a very definitive release on the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx, as well as, as we were talking about earlier, with the Slalom, or Shalom as you call it, that style progressive game, um, Space Harrier actually had a very, very good release on the Turbo Graphics, which, if you didn't know, is a Sega property. It was made by Sega and only ever released like Arcade and the Genesis up until it got compilation releases on like the Sega Saturn and the Dreamcast. So there were cases, none with Nintendo that I can think of, but there were cases of some companies like Sega actually licensing out their games that they made to Hudson and NEC for the PC Engine. Interesting. Which is something you never heard of back in the day. Like, I mean, even today, you know, that'd be like, it'd be like Sony making a first-party title and then actually licensing it out to Microsoft or Nintendo. Right, it'd be like putting Master Chief in Smash Brothers. 
It'd be like putting a Halo game on the Wii U. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it goes deeper than just like, oh, we're lending you a character. It's an entire sure. game or series. Yeah. So all of this comes to a head. Talking about cute em ups talking about the, the, the arcade boards. What are they called? Uh, depends. Um, CPS 2 and 3 were what we were talking about predominantly. Okay, but I, uh, I meant the home, the console, consoleized Consoleized or Super Gun. Okay, so Super Gun, consoleized arcade boards, talking about that stuff, talking about, talking about shooters and emulation and all that stuff. I've tried emulated it on my Wii. I've not tried it on my computer. I know I can get... PC, the ROM for, you can get a huh? lot more optimized emulators, too. I mean, the Wii's, there's a lot of good homebrew for emulators made for it, but nowhere near what's available on the PC. Yeah, yeah, the compatibility is quite limited on a lot of, because I, I used to be, I went on this binge where I downloaded tons of modded ROMs of old games, mm-hmm. which I've reviewed some, the Chrono Trigger Flames of Eternity, I played about half of. I played okay. Final Fantasy. So are you talking? Six. Are you talking about like the fan games where they yeah, remix yeah. it? And, okay. Yeah, fan mods. Yeah, yeah, fan mods. Uh, the Chrono Trigger one, Final Fantasy VI, the complete hack, and Final Fantasy VI, uh, the Eternal Crystals mm. hack. Both of those, like I, I review, I even reviewed some of those, and I installed all these mods and all these fan hacks on my on my Wii. But yeah, only a few of them ran. And again, Mame is very limited. So Wii emulation's fine, but at the time I installed on my Wii emulation, I didn't have my PC hooked up to my TV. Now that my PC is hooked up to my TV, obviously I can easily just start using PC emulators. So there's literally no reason to keep... There's actually literally no reason to keep my Wii at this point. I have a Wii U. You, what am I doing? You have it for portability and traveling, but <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, the Wii has kind of largely become obsolete. I mean, I should leave it at my parents' house. That's a good idea. Huh. It's a brilliant idea. So whenever I go home, I can play any Super Nintendo or NES game or X-Men or The Simpsons. Save a family. Donate a Wii. Yeah, seriously. That's actually not a bad idea at all. I'm totally going to do that. All right. Well, I'm glad we could. I'm glad, listener, that you were here to hear me realize what to do with my old Wii console. Our passion for you listeners drives us to inspiration. It's, it's true. The point I was trying to make is there is one arcade game that is my most coveted arcade game memory other than Alien vs. Predator. Mm-hmm. The original listener. I'm not talking about the one from the movie, if they even made one. I'm talking about Alien vs. Predator, the 84 or 85 arcade game. Uh, it was 93 or 4, I think, if I'm right. I right. was so wrong. 93 or 94 <laughs> arcade game. Oh, that game was so good. Actually, John and I... John, the usual co-host here of Unqualified Gamers, John and I used to go to the arcade, and we would play Alien vs. Predator nonstop the entire time. He and I have beaten that game together more times than I think I've beaten any other arcade game, and that might include The Simpsons or X-Men. Did you know that that's actually one of Capcom's most requested ports for Xbox Live and PSN, Cody? Alien vs. Predator? Oh, hands down. The problem is the rights with it, because it's Aliens and Predator, the rights to everything lies with 20th 20th Century Fox. But once they started moving the X-Men arcade game and the Simpsons, that was like the number one thing everybody begged and pleaded with Capcom for was AVP. No way. Oh, I played the crap out of it when I was a kid, too. You put in a quarter, and you just hear that, time to hunt, time to hunt. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god, getting Super Magazine when I was a kid, I had no idea a magazine was actually an ammunition container for a gun. So, you know, you'd pick up the Super Magazine in the game, and it would give you unlimited shots for whatever your shot is. I thought it was literally just, like, a paper magazine that was called Super Magazine, and for some reason it would take away your ability to overheat. Uh, both finding out all the special attacks, because, like most Capcom beat ups of that era... Every character had unique attacks, and then, I mean, like, even the jumping, you know, if you hold forward, if you press up, if you did down, up, and an attack, you'd get a special attack. It was a good game. It was an amazing game. And it holds up, because when I was on a road trip last summer to the West Coast, I went to a barcade in Portland, Oregon, Mm. and they had the game, and I played it, and I texted John a bunch of pictures of me playing it, and it 
totally holds up and it was super worth it. That game I cannot recommend enough. So, listener, if you have not played Alien vs. Predator, go get that. But the game I'm referring to, other than that game, that I am that I have not played in, I can't even remember when I last played it, <laughs> Gunbird 2. Gunbird 2? Did you realize that had a Dreamcast port? I did realize that had a Dreamcast port, and like an idiot, I gave my Dreamcast to... I gave my Dreamcast away. Okay. Now, to someone. Did you a couple realize? Years ago, did you and realize? That was a horrible mistake. I guarantee you that if Mars Matrix was a CPS2 release, Gunbird 2 was as well, so you can actually run that in MAME. And I'm pretty sure you could run it in MAME on your Wii. I tried it on my Wii, it didn't work. Might have been a bad ROM set. What does X Men run on? What do, what do X Men and The Simpsons run on? Those were old Konami. I think those were JAMA boards. Okay, because I know JAMA. Because then I know JAMA works on my Wii, but I don't know about the CP ones. You could try other CPS two ones. You could just go on Wikipedia or Google and just look up, you know, list of CPS two releases, and you should be able to find a whole dearth of them and just try a couple and see which ones work and which ones don't. It is true. I mean, at this point, again, I may just get it on my computer because why wouldn't i so before it was i just felt so cool oh emulators on my wii look at that i can use my wii controller hey look at that how cool yeah all right cool Mm. i didn't really say it like that that's a weird way to say it well we've so so now that listen i hope you enjoyed that retrospective on arcade game boards and turbo graphic 60 that is actually one of the most funnest things i think we've talked about on this podcast for a while if if only because by default you're better than John. I mean, look at him. <laughs> hey, I'm not the one with a kid. I'm not the one with an amazing, perfect creation. <laughs> oh god, that's that true. kid he is like a... so cute. It's not even funny. It is not even funny. And this is the point. So normally at this point we would talk about our weekends. All I did was play video games all weekend. Oh good. So I yeah, which is great. I didn't really do a lot, and I I don't want to. To ignore your weekend, but I do want to just focus on one specific thing that I know you did because I want to talk a little bit about a different thing. And I know that you've been working on a cosplay. Yes. And I soon will be working on a cosplay because we've only got a month and a half before you and I. So, listen, a guy and I are going to go to Anime Central or ASIN, which is in Rosemont or basically Chicago. Mm. It's just outside Chicago at the Rosemont Convention Center in the third weekend in May? Yeah, it's the 16th through the 18th. Sure. So we're going to be at Anime Central, and Guy is working on a cosplay, and I... I Now, listener, you, you can see if you go to our Google Plus page, Unqualified Gamers Google Plus page, you can see my past cosplays as Booker DeWitt from Bioshock Infinite, which was a pretty good cosplay, I thought. It was very well uh, done. It was very well yeah, done. Th- thank you. Uh, from an, And now that's from a video game, Bioshock Infinite. Mm-hmm. Then I have also done Dr. Horrible from the live action sci-fi internet musical by Joss Whedon. Sing-along so I've blog. got those two niches. And I, I wore the Doctor. Ho- I, I I cosplayed as Doctor Horrible when we went to Ace in two years ago, mm. but neither of those are from anime. So I had a couple ideas for an anime cosplay, and one was Genji, Am- Amino Genji from Get Backers, which I think is a really good show. Mm-hmm. I have watched that. Genji would be an easy cosplay for me. But then I went to Rockford over St. Patrick's Day weekend, and I saw a guy, and he said. Bring a, a hard drive or some flash drives because I have a show to give you. And he gave me the first season? First season? Yeah, first season. Of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Now, listener, I don't want this to spin off into a. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to spin off into like anime oblivion and have this become an anime <laughs> podcast now. But since anime and video game culture is somewhat closely combined i think it's worth talking about jojo's bizarre adventure first of all i've decided i'm going to cosplay as a character from it and guy is also going to be cosplaying as a different character from it but what was explained to me is that this jojo's bizarre adventure is basically as popular as dragon ball z or sailor moon in japan but has only been a manga since the late 80s so it's been running for like 25 years mm mm-hmm. And only just became an anime a year or two ago because they had trouble with licensing 
because a lot of the characters are named after American musicians. Well, that's the thing. As... It's only fairly recently actually been imported. When I watched it, and what you watched was the original Japanese broadcast, and that's why it largely hasn't been brought over through all the many chapters and volumes is the licensing issue. And we can tie this to games, because both the old game as well as the new game coming out in the U.S. will both touch on that as well. Okay, so give an overview on JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, because I'm only six episodes in, and I love it. Now, is it a shonen? It is definitely shonen, um, maybe a sprinkling of seinen, but it is okay. very it, much a shonen, or if you prefer listeners to be not familiar with the term, a very kind of battle of the week type show. You know, it's the kind of serialization where you have an overarching story and you have central characters and side characters, but they tend to get in fights a lot, either by choice or by fate. Um, something similar to Bleach, Naruto, Dragon Ball Z would all be very good examples of shonen that were very popular One Piece. So something in that similar vein. And the actual series itself is about a family, the Joestar family, and how their fate is tied to originally one man, Dio Brando, who is very recurrent throughout the series. And Dio is the character I'm planning on cosplaying. Which you will make a magnificent Dio. <laughs> we'll see. Will you remember how many pieces of bread you've eaten in your life? <laughs> that, is, that is an You know, I saw that line and I almost texted you because that is an amazing line. Oh, just, oh, it's, it's so wondrous. It really is. But there is the problem with the licensing. Um, when we were talking about the CPS2 prior and the older systems, a good example would be there was actually a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure game, and this is what got me into it before I even knew it was a thing was I grew up on a very, very steady diet of 2D fighters, and Capcom released the first one they made on the PlayStation 1. It also had a Dreamcast and arcade release, what was known. They just called it JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Heritage for the Future, but it's based on the third volume of the manga. So it's not at the beginning. It's at the third part, which at the time had finished up fairly recently, um, it's still very popular to this day. It's still probably the single most popular of all the different story arcs and sets of characters they've done. Okay. but So kind of similar to how there are only Dragon Ball Z fighting video games, never Dragon Ball fighting games. Largely, yes. Um, there were a couple JoJo's games that were specifically not fighters, but they never saw release stateside, and they tend to be very derivative. But sir, like the Dragon Ball games. Yes, yes. Because there are a couple Dragon original Dragon Ball games, but they're not fighters, and they're not really widely known here. No, no, not outside of I'd say probably Legacy of Goku one and two for Game Boy Advance are probably the only ones that really, and Dragon Ball Origins for the DS. Sure, fairly popular. But I digress. So the game came out here, but the problem is the creator and artist Hirohiko Araki has a tendency to name almost all of the characters or things related to the characters <laughs> in the series after actual real-life musicians, bands, musical acts, albums, or songs. So in Japan, the copyright law, it's, it's whatever, it's not a big deal. Here in the States, it's a big problem. <laughs> And right. they do not want the lawsuits on their hands. So there were some characters... Oh, what were some of the really bad ones? I remember one of them was, there's a character in part three named Devo the Cursed. Devo is in, you know, question, are we, we men? Answer, we are Devo. And he was renamed to Debo, like the guy Tiny Lister played in the movie Friday. You know, hey, Smokey, you got my 40? Sure, why not? Um, there was one named Mariah, who was actually originally named Mariah Carey, and they just shortened it to Mariah. And almost everything else was intact in the game because they didn't overdub it. You know, it was still Japanese voices. A lot of the dialogue was kind of half censored slash changed in the actual writing. But I absolutely loved it. I mean, it's kind of endearing to a lot of people who grew up on or go back and play older two dimensional fighters. It's very similar to Darkstalkers and the Darkstalkers series and how it plays, but it has its own unique quirks and twists. Now, the new game that's coming, well, came out in Japan 
last year and is surprisingly getting a U.S. release thanks to Bandai Namco is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle. Now, where the first game that Capcom made only covers the third volume and the first season that Cody watched only covers the first two volumes or story arcs, All-Star Battle covers all eight. And the eighth one is actually still ongoing. It's one that's printed weekly and published in Shonen Jump or whatever Lucky Land Communications sticks it in. And, oh my god, the game is huge. It is literally probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, fan service games I have ever seen in my life. Huh. Now, I had no inkling this could possibly, possibly get a U.S. release. One, because I didn't think they'd gauge enough fan interest. And two, it was a PS3 release. And, as I'm sure many of our listeners are aware, maybe some of you are not, PS3 games, with the exception of maybe one or two titles are entirely region-free. So people who really wanted the game just imported it from Japan already. Oh, because we figured, we figured we would never get a release here, so, you know, people who read the manga and follow the series are already going to know what's going on in the game, and most of them have a very basic, if not intermediate, understanding of Japanese language and sounds that they could actually follow the dialogue. Plus, I mean, people tran there's translation FAQs out there for everything already. There were videos on YouTube that were subtitled, like, weeks after the character announcements were made before the game even came out. From the game? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Oh, this was... You have no idea how big this was when it was coming out, Cody. <laughs> but I digress. So it's getting a release in the U.S. on April 29th on the PS3... It's going to be digital download only on the PSN. I honestly, which isn't uncommon because I know they've done that with some of the One Piece um, Dynasty Warriors games, Kaizoku Muso. Um, they've done that with a handful of other ones. But it actually is getting a physical release, or it was going to have one available. I don't know if it's sold out or if they're still taking them. You could pre order it through Club Namco, which was Bandai Namco's actual, like, you know, pro shop, I guess. Their specialty store where you can get exclusive figures and clothing and whatnot. Or on Amazon supposedly had it, but when I checked on Amazon after the announcement and I jumped on it immediately because I figured if I didn't, I will never see a physical copy of this game in my life Right. for the U.S. version. I couldn't find any indication which copies were Asian region, Japanese region, or like world region compared to the English one. Now, I don't read or speak Japanese at all. So, I need English subtitles, and that's what this game will have. Now, the funny thing is, they've actually had to go and re-censor a lot of the characters' names and things for the right. U.S. release again. And, of course, this news came out as we're approaching the release date. It wasn't announced, like, the day they said, you know, Oh, yeah, we're gonna bring it out here, and by the way, it's gonna be censored heavily so we don't get sued to oblivion. Of course. But they've also changed some of the basic dialogue, which... I mean, a lot of it's just kind of like silly puns and things, which makes it extra amusing to me, although a lot of fans are like, it's not pure, it's not saved anymore, you know, wah, cry me a river, you're getting the f***ing game. Although, it's just like the Bravely Default thing where they changed some of the character costumes and everybody cried foul, you know. Lesser of two evils. It's going to be censored, People but you're still getting about that? The, oh, the, my people, God, there was Video whining. games have been doing that for years. Oh, yes, they have. But it's it's always the outcry of, you know, well, if they censor that, they're going to censor everything. Or if they don't censor that, why bother censoring everything? I digress. Yeah. So the game's coming out here, and the funniest thing is some of the characters that were censored for names before aren't, and some of the ones that aren't now are. A good example would be, and listeners, I mean, I've... I'd love to hear, you know, go ahead and send messages and things if you're familiar with the artist. But one of the central characters to the third part is Jean-Pierre Polnareff, named after Michael Polnareff, the singer, a French singer. I had only heard of him because I was familiar with the character. <laughs> In the first game that came out, Capcom's just like, oh, Jean-Pierre Polnareff, whatever, nobody will ever know. And they just threw it in there. This time around, his name is actually listed on the character select screen and in battles as Jean-Pierre Eiffel. Get it, Eiffel Tower, <laughs> he's French! Uh, wow. Seven. Yeah, but wow. The, the best part of this is all the dialogue and things they've changed. It's a Japanese release getting a digital release on the U.S., so there's no overdub whatsoever. 
So all the voices in the game are still the original Japanese, and none of it is censored. So even though it'll say Jean-Pierre Eiffel, characters will still call him Polnareff in the game. Good. And, like, all the attacks and stands and things that are named, you know, like, Red Hot Chili Peppers that a guy from Part 4 uses, Akira uses... I honestly don't think... Th I think they just call him Chili Pepper or Chili or something in the dialogue, yeah. but in-game vocals, when he uses the attacks, he'll still say, Red Hot Chili Peppers! <laughs> While he's jamming out on a guitar. It's just... Oh, I love it. Oh, oh localization ridiculous. departments. Those legal teams. They're something. They are, and it's always the lesser of two evils because you have companies that... You know, you've got some, like, uh, NIS is relatively considered to keep things mostly pure. Sometimes the fans will say, oh, you censored this. I remember Mugen Souls had something removed from it that people were screaming and crying about, but I don't think half the people screaming and crying even bought the game to begin with or ever intended to. Um, Atlas is a big localizer who does tend to censor things here and there, but it's not too bad. And then you have some of the more specialty ones like Xseed, the guys who have been really good about bringing over a lot of the Ease games and is still working on bringing over the Trails in the Sky or Legend of Heroes series games that came out on the PSP. They managed to get the first one over here, but the latter ones, I think they're still working on the second one to get translated for a Vita digital release. Hmm. But they are very... If I remember correctly, I want to say that they're... Very much in the vein of working designs. Now, Cody, I don't know if you're familiar with the old company working designs at all. No. They brought over a lot of them. Um, they're the reason we got the old Lunar games in the U.S. Oh, oh I've played the Lunar games. As well as a handful of shooters and other things. Um, I, They might have done Silhouette Mirage and some of the other treasure releases. But John actually owns, by the way, I think John owns both Lunar games, like the rare ones that are worth a lot of money. Well, I know he, are you talking about John Simon or John Martin? John Martin. Okay, because I know John Simon actually had the Sega CD release of Eternal Blue, I think, when we were younger. Yeah, which I seriously doubt he still has. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, they they one. get up there, and a lot of them went up price actually because working designs went out of business. So it's you know it's not only a game that's hard to find in that form and was small printed to begin with, but it's also a defunct company that'll never come back. Yeah. But Working Designs is very much in the same vein that Xseed was, where they really, really go out of their way to keep from altering or censoring things as they translate it, or, you know, to maintain as much accuracy as possible, compared to other companies that do. Okay. So it'll be... okay... I think it'll be fine. Um, honestly, if you're that mad about it, chances are you already imported it or you're going to import it anyways, and you already have a translation FAQ favorited in Firefox or Chrome. So you have nothing to worry about. And people who do buy it in the US are going to buy it because we love the series. The game is, by all rights, just absolutely stupidly gorgeous. Um, <laughs> decently playing. It's by CyberConnect2 who are the same guys that made... They've actually made an interesting span of games. They made all the old dot .hack RPGs for the those, PS2. Uh, John loves those games. They've made the greater majority of the Naruto 3D fighting games from this last generation for PS3 and 360 and PC. They made Sola to Robo Red the Hunter for the Nintendo DS, which was a kind of 3D action RPG where you're a dog who rides in a giant robot suit which is okay. very fun. Cody, if you never tried it, I'll either send you a link or lend you my copy. Of course. Just a whole bunch of different games. Oh, and uh, Asura's Wrath, the ill-fated release from Capcom for the 360 and PS3, which a lot of people didn't have quite the greatest reception for. I absolutely adored it in its simplicity and cinematography because it was a game that was kind of sold. Are you familiar with it at all, Cody? No, I, I feel like I've heard the name, just not... Mm. I haven't played it. Okay, well, it's a game that's centered around... God, what kind of mythology is it? It's a specific Middle Eastern mythology and, like, pantheon of gods. I can't think of what it actually is called right now. I'm just having a brain fart, but... I digress. Basically, you're an angry, pissed-off god, and it's retelling a story of that, but it's a mix of, like, ancient mythology crossed with a sci-fi angle, and you play as basically the most pissed-off demigod that's ever lived, 
and you fight these other demigods trying to rescue your daughter and set everything right and get your revenge. And there's one, I mean, one of the gods, and this was in the demo when the game came out, grows bigger than the size of the moon and attacks you by pushing down his thumb from space, which is like the size of the state of Tennessee. And you what? catch it with your arms and push it back and punch the crap out of it. Wow, that's some Final Fantasy summon stuff right there. The problem is, yeah, I mean, the game is basically, like, ridiculous over-the-top summons and battles of the game, but the problem is, it's done episodically, so literally, like, a level will actually open with, like, a title card and chapter one, and then at the end of the chapter, it'll actually have to be continued before it loads the next, cha like, level, and then at the beginning of the next level, previously on Azura's Wrath, <laughs> so it's very cinematic in how it's displayed. Um, it wasn't very meaty in the actual beat em up mechanics. It's kind of very simplistic fighting system, which made a lot of people angry because it's nowhere near like a you know a proper Ninja Gaiden or Devil May Cry or something or God Hands, something along those lines, which is what people were expecting. But it's more giant set pieces. And a lot of QTEs, which kind of piss people off, because QTEs are in everything nowadays. I mean, QTEs. It, it was it was literally like the most it was the most fun anime I've ever played. Oh, it's, quick time events. Yes, yes, quick time events. That's what those are. Mashing buttons to cues on the screen, or sometimes just mashing it until you break your controller. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty much everywhere these days. Yeah, well, Azura's Wrath was about 30% QTEs. But the thing okay. is, it was QTEs set to amazing jaw-dropping, like, I can't believe I'm doing this! Ah! I've never screamed, like, out of anger and joy and ecstasy at my TV screen mashing a single button before. But this game was just so, like, ah! I'm gonna quote you on that. Seriously, it made me unleash my overdrive! <laughs> overdrive! -o! And, listener, that's from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I'm at the part where they're starting to get, like, really get into the fights, and JoJo just used about eight moves in a row where he said, overdrive! It was, like, turquoise... Blue ribbon overdrive and then sunlight, yellow... Yeah, sunlight yellow overdrive is the most famous one. Yeah, yeah, so... Listeners, to give you just a the most absolutely, like, dumbed-down, bare-bones explanation of what the first series is, it's basically crazy kung fu secret techniques versus immortal vampires. Yeah, wow, it is, that... It is Fist of the North Star versus Dracula, and it is astounding. It's glorious. I like it a lot. It's it's a show that does not beat around the bush. No. And does not take its time getting to the meat of everything. And by the third episode, literally every line is screaming. <laughs> in the best possible way. With floating just, onomatopoeias in the background. And just, oh. oh my god, it's so good. It's so good. And it's it's all screaming. There there's no filler. I mean, after the after the first or second episode, it it jumps to seven years later. There are a lot I of mean, rapid time transitions. <laughs> yeah, it just goes. It it and it it'll it'll start a new episode, and you're way beyond what happened in the previous one. They're like, yeah, well, we basically said what you need to know. Let's let's do a forward now. So they they don't they do not mince words. They just. Get to it. There is not one single scene in that show that is filler or just there. So, I like it a lot. It's a good show. I'm glad you're enjoying it. It's it's something that could be immensely popular here, especially if it had a somewhat concurrent release with everything that's ever happened with it. But, like I said, copyright and intellectual property-wise, it's absolutely unfeasible. Yeah, there is a character whose na whose last name is literally Speedwagon. His full name is Robert E.O. Speedwagon for R.E.O. Speedwagon. <laughs> and this, um, uh, and the two guys that he was fighting, you know, that you're watching right now, Tarkus and Bruder. Yeah. Uh, Bill Bruder was actually the drummer for one of the other bands one of the guys is named after. I think he was the drummer for Yes. Good. Or someone else, yeah. It's Oh my god. And I'm waiting until you get to part two, because the Pillar Men is where people really start scratching their heads at the names. It's a trio of guys 
and their names are Wham, ACDC. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And why can't I think of Cars? Cars is the other one named after the Cars. But here's the funny. Here's the funniest part. Okay, it's not that they're literally named after the bands. They are, but it's the spelling. The spelling of their names. The proper spelling. Like if you actually did it out in katakana or hiragana is still a corruption so like acdc isn't actually ac slash dc it's a s i d i c i or like wham is actually spelled and should be pronounced whamu w-h-a-m-m-u so but yeah it's only in the localization (laughs) where those copyright infringements come up yeah because immediately and i mean there are some like later on the series you have a guy whose name is notorious big and his stan's name is life after death like (laughs) there's no mistake there's no mistranslation just like lawsuit here we go yeah and even the guy i'm cosplaying dio is spelled d-i-o after ronnie james dio (laughs) yep yeah, but JoJo is not Jonathan Joestar is not a no. Um, the central characters have actually never because they're all their names. It's called JoJo's Bizarre Adventure because in every single volume and story arc, the main name, the main character's name can be reduced to JoJo either the way it's presented or actually through like the history of the character. Um, good example would be the first one is Jonathan Joestar. The second one's protagonist, his grandson is Joseph Joestar, Jojo. In the third one, which is... The anime is actually... It's going to start airing in Japan on April 4th, which is why I wanted you to watch what's out now, so you'd be ready for the next dearth, because it's going to be ah. subbed and released weekly. Oh, God. There's That's no, my there's birthday, no, by the way. There's nothing like watching these shows weekly, even though I've already read everything, and it's like a true one-to-one to the manga, so I know exactly what's going to happen. There's just this extra dimension to seeing it animated and voiced. But his name's Jotaro Kujo, although technically he's like the bastard son of another Joe who is the grandson of Joseph from part two. So even though he's Jotaro Kujo, Jojo, he's technically Jotaro Joestar. Then you get to the fourth part and you have Josuke Higashikata, and he's actually the bastard son of Joseph from part two, so he's Jotaro's uncle, even though he's like eight to ten years younger. Because, yes, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, Joseph is just that much of a player. So even though he's Jotaro Higa- or Josuke Higashikata, he's technically Josuke Joestar. Then you get to part five. Part five is absolutely amazing, and I'm sorry, spoilers, spoiler alert. I apologize if I'm spoiling this, but I'm also spoiling something that's been around for better part of a decade and a half now so apologies is Giorno Giovanna who is Gio Gio or Jojo but Gio is also close to Dio because he's actually the bastard son of from the very first part Dio Brando now that might sound kind of crazy considering you oh my god it's been like 50 or 70 or 80 years since the first part how is this his son Because he's an immortal vampire, and because he's just that awesome. But beyond that, and Cody... No, I can't go there. I can't go there. Cody, there's a spoiler I will not unleash on you, because you have to watch it. And listeners, I hope you can get to that point before I come back at a future date and spoil it. And speaking of which, speaking of if the listener wants to watch it, what is the best way to watch it? I honestly cannot remember if it got properly localized or not. And if it did, ladies and gentlemen, please support your local <laughs> dubbing companies and all your localizations like ADV and all those fun companies and Funimation, if you can stomach it. But you can get releases of the fan subs through various torrent sites and sources. Um, nya.se, N-Y-A-A dot S-E is probably the most common and prevalent. I can recommend, if you can, Nutbladder or Kami are probably the best subgroups. Which you can just do a Google search for Nutbladder, that's no space, just N-U-T-B-L-A-D-D-E-R, or Kami, C-O-M-M-I-E, 
and you'll find their website with their releases and information on where to get all these wonderful shows you had no idea you should be watching, but now you can. Seriously, because because there are uh, several different groups of subtitle that to varying degrees of accuracy and success correct yes and there are some that are specifically meant to be parody and joke subs um <laughs> jojo had a specific one that was called duang which is a joke based on the transla- fan translation of part four of the series was originally only available it was translated by a gentleman or group of gentlemen or ladies from hong kong who english was not their first language so there are a lot of very broken English statements, and for some reason, the word duong and abaj is everywhere. So, <laughs> the duong subs are specifically jokes. Like, there'd be a scene in part one where Dio does something to Joseph and then, you know, coddles him for being an idiot and being clumsy. Whereas, <laughs> in the duong subs, it'd be like, no, you cannot do that because you are not as cool as me, Dio. Or when somebody compliments Jojo on doing something well in an episode, they actually they actually subtitle it as "You did a good Joe job." <laughs> and it's just oh, there's I mean, there's gags that are actual references to the source material, and then there's just completely off the wall, like why did you even do this ones? So okay. I will recommend listeners if you go out and find the series and go looking for subs. Don't start with Duong because you will be so lost. I can't even describe it. <laughs> so the one you gave me is by is that Kami or Nut Nut Shitter? You is that right? Nut Bladder. Oh, Nut Bladder. Named after a fictional organ that was discovered in the male body after the existence of Hitamari Sketch. But I digress. Um, no, I think Hayatsuki. I think I got for you. Because I had to, get, I wanted to get you ones that were available that you could watch on the PS3 or other sources. Gotcha. Do be aware, but- listeners, if you don't already have something to play it on, the majority of fan subs nowadays are released in either .mp4 or .mkv, Matroska Video. Matroska Video doesn't have very many playback options outside of a PC or smart Blu-ray player. Um, MP4 will play on your iPods, it'll play on your iPads, your PS4, PS3s, your... Xbox 360s, PS1s, I'm pretty... Well, not PS1s. Xbox 1s and PS4s, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. God, I wish I played on the PS1. They gotcha, guy. Oh, they got me good. But this, so there's just a lot of different ones. And I mean, the subs that you got, Cody, they're not as integral, I guess, as I'd like them to be. But they are suitable, and they definitely get the job done. Excellent. Well, in the future, I can use other formats now that my PC's on my TV. I would recommend using Matroska Video, then, because Matroska Video is a standard... Like, if somebody actually rips something at Blu-ray quality, Matroska Video is the only thing that's going to handle it properly, as well as if you watch something with multiple voice tracks, say it's a video file from a DVD or Blu-ray that has commentary or has multiple languages, Matroska Video actually has containers for that where the file will play back with multiple subtitle or audio tracks. That's what MKV stands for, Matroska Video? Yes. Did not know that. The more you know. Seriously. We're learning every day here. We we literally, like, I mean, we pretty much are going to wrap up in a second. <laughs> Even though we literally, like, we went from introduction to semi, like... We basically didn't get to the podcast, but we did the podcast. Oh, no, we podcasted a lot. And it was awesome, and I'm totally okay with this. And you realize you're going to have to have me back again at some point because we didn't touch on, like, 90% of what we were going to talk about. <laughs> I don't even know what we The Mass to Effect, talk- the Deception, uh, Yoshihiko you wanted to touch on. <laughs> I did, I di- yes. So you are definitely coming back. Next time I get a Sunday off and we can we can actually have that happen because there is there's another live action Japanese TV show that is a parody of the Dragon Quest series and many other video game role RP- playing RPGs games as sports. a whole but definitely yeah. 8-bit Dragon Quests. Definitely. So there is a live action Japanese TV show called The Hero Yoshihiko mm-hmm. that guy gave me that we've both watched i'm gonna finish watching it before we have you on again and then we can talk about that because that i think the listener would really enjoy it's very funny oh yes and, no, outstanding 
Yeah, and honestly, I'm glad we, that because you mentioned at one point you did want to talk about the Mass Effect trilogy, but I haven't played any of those games. Well, it's so. it's less. I wanted to touch less on the actual games themselves so much as what they've shown and how they're the perfect example of how games evolved over the last generation, both in terms of marketing and release. Well, that's fair. I, w- I would still I, I can, think it would you know, be better with John around. Yeah, I'll do it with John, definitely, but it, it's something you'll be able to follow even without ever having touched the series. Although I do yeah, recommend, you're... and listeners as well, if you haven't played the games do play them. It's hands down one of, if not my favorite series from the last five years, six years. You have played use of Mass Effect. Yeah. How many times have you beaten two? Two, I think I'm around 12 to 14 playthroughs. How about three? Three, I have actually only beaten once. And that's oh, because okay. I beat it and then I got really busy and never got around to importing any of my shepherds and just said, oh, I'll come back to it someday. And I haven't gotten back yet. But you beat the second one around 12 times. 12 to 14. I can't remember the exact number. <sighs> I mean, oh man. I barely replay... I barely replay NES games these days. I barely have time to sit to... I mean, I barely prioritize sitting around and replaying through Mega Man 2 mm-hmm. in a night, let alone... <laughs> An entire that. like 40 to 60 hour game. Back to no, back I mean, to I, back to back. I played Final Fantasy 13 twice... Mm-hmm. Because I got a PS3 after I had beaten it on Xbox 360 ah. and wanted to play it with smoother frame rate and graphics. Glorious, and uncompressed sound. That was one of the biggest reasons to get 13 on the PS3. Yeah, and it's got a good soundtrack. And Lightning Returns continues to have an amazing soundtrack. And actually, when you talked about that that game that would say to be continued and then last time on... Mm-hmm. Final Fantasy XIII 2 actually had a, in principle, very cool feature where whenever you loaded up the game, it would show a couple clips of previous cutscenes you had done. Oh. So it was kind of like a last time on, and it would show a few quotes and then zip you into the game. Okay. So like a TV show, and it would say previously on whatever. It was previously on Final Fantasy XIII 2. And it, it would have been really, really awesome but they didn't focus it didn't always pick up on plot point dialogue okay so it would show them saying things but they would just be kind of random out of context sentences mm. that didn't help you catch up on where you were okay they were just kind of there and it was it, fine, it wouldn't be but... like this is how the plot progressed to be like man this sandwich is delicious <laughs> yes yeah stuff like that and it, it didn't really serve the purpose I think it was intended to serve. It was still pretty cool, and I thought interesting, and I, mm-hmm. I liked that they tried it, but oh well. Final Fantasy XIII, oh boy. Hopefully I will finish Lightning Returns this week, hopefully, oh. and be able to report next week Well, I, how that goes. Much like the other listeners, I will be waiting with bated breath to hear how it goes. Yes, thank you for joining. Now... People, if people want to tweet at you or follow you on Twitter, because you tweet, I tweet. I, I have been right? known to twit on occasion. It is true, and your at handle is Son of Whole Horse again. Oh my God, another JoJo's reference. S O N O F H O L H O R S E. And Whole Horse is a, a character in a JoJo? character from the third volume. Yes. Because you've been using that screen name forever, and I've never known what it is. I fell in love with the character from playing the Capcom fighting game before I even really knew who he was. <laughs> awesome. It, it it almost reminds me of Dragon... So Dragon Ball Z was out in America at the time, oh, yeah. but Dragon Ball GT Final Bout being released before Dragon Ball GT hit American shores. Mm-hmm. And that was back in, in the times... That was back before you could just... To- I mean, you couldn't watch it online. No, no. Uh, you couldn't you torrent to- it. You could, Yeah, you couldn't well, download th- th- it. There think was- about it, Cody. Okay, this is taking us back, and listeners, you may not remember what it was like when we were this old. It was literally like going to Anime Club and having to buy fan-subbed VHSs of the Broly movies and have them mailed to you. Yeah, There was no download back in the day for fan sub shows. You had to go through mailing lists or catalogs or God help you. 
IRC chats, maybe? I don't know, what came before that? You had, like, alt.binaries.animation.whatever. And you would have to mail someone money, but only the cost of shipping and materials for the VHS tape to record it on, because it was illegal to sell it for profit. Right. Which is also why fan sub downloads are freely distributed nowadays, at least until the show actually gets picked up for localization and release and publication in the U.S. Right. So, that's... You know, this is the 64th episode of Unqualified Gamers. Nintendo 64! I know, we didn't mention Nintendo 64 Aww. once. We talked about... You know, I thought 64. about that. I thought about that at some point and then just forgot about it. So maybe... Well, no, now it's too late. And now it's too late. I can't be like, oh, John, John and I will talk about N64 <laughs> next week. No. And I, I would love to talk to you about it, but it's... I mean, we're, we're going on close to two hours, and at this point, the listener has probably learned so many things about about arcades and TurboGrafx-16 and downloading things and subtitled anime fan subs. It's, and it's information overload. Seriously, edutainment all over it. So then to make the most briefest, the most briefest conversation about Nintendo 64 that we can have, favorite N64 game, go. Oh, jeez. Um, Currently... Tie- it's got to be a tie between GoldenEye, the classic, and Jet Force Gemini. Currently? Yeah. Oh, they both. Like, if you had a Nintendo 64 on your, in your room right now, in the room where you are, in a TV next to it, and you had to put in any game you wanted, and you would just start playing it. I will give you the caveat, Cody, that I never actually owned a Nintendo 64. Okay. <laughs> and honestly, I'm going to have to give it to Jet Force Gemini. Okay. All right. Never played it. Uh, you did have a TurboGrafx-16, so you are 25% as qualified as I am to talk about <laughs> bits of systems. Yeah. Hey, it's so not... I finally it could be it. like the Jaguar. Do the math. Okay. That's true. Well, I, I'm also going to go with a tie. Okay. My tie for a game... That, because cause I picked up GoldenEye on New Year's Day mm-hmm. when some guy... Who, at this party I was at, he had Goldeneye out. My God, that game does not hold up. Not even, oh, yeah, I won't really get into that. <laughs> but the two that I would say that I would pick up and play right now in my living room, WWF No Mercy, <laughs> best wrestling game ever. I it read really a is. Did You Know Gaming meme. I don't know if this is true, but the Did You Know Gaming meme said that THQ is working on a port of WWF No Mercy for next generation consoles. But they stopped development when the playtesters said that if they got that game, they would never buy another WWE game. I can believe it. I can believe it. That's how good it is. Yeah. So, WWF No Mercy and Star Fox 64. Okay. Yeah. Star Fox, I figure that had to be up there for you. Star Fox 64, easily one of the best video games ever made. Almost infinite replay value. So many quotes. My God, the quotes. <laughs> so many quotes. I used to know that game script like the back of my hand. Just such a such a delight to play. Nothing about that game is bad. And I will say that it's continued to age spectacularly. Yeah, it holds up. You know, it's it does not look super great, but it it doesn't look bad it doesn't look it's it's not hard to look at like final fantasy 7 yeah yeah you know cloud's hand pixels the size of bumper cars (laughs) yeah it's like i mean sorry square but Uh, uh you really need to re-release that game like desperately yeah desperately that's that's a race in the hole man it's been people have been saying it for years once they're at risk of going bankrupt from making weird weird decisions about releases they're just going to pop that game out. They'll be back in the black in like a month. They'll be back in black! Just like one of the three pillar men. Yes. ACDC. So, listener, follow Guy at Son of Whole Horse. And uh, please comment on our website, unqualifiedgamers.com. I'd love to hear what you thought about this episode. As We're also about. on Google+. Plus. Yes. And, uh, wait, what'd you say? Well, I would also like to hear what they have to think about the episode. And what they've oh, been thank playing. You. That's what I said, we. Hmm. Didn't I say we? I don't know. Maybe. 
I meant the royal wi- Listen, guy, you're an unqualified <laughs> gamer, so you are now one of us. One of us. One of us. Yes. Gibble gobble, gibble gobble. Yes. So, yeah, listen to go to unqualifiedgamers.com, and we're going to have more and more content in weeks to come. Hopefully, I uh, I have some plans. I have some ideas for stuff and all that. There's also And there's links to Twitter and Google Plus and YouTube and all that other stuff there. So, yeah, all that and a bag of d- How do you feel about that? I don't think I want that. Yeah? No. What if it's a bag of overdrive? Oh, I'd take that bag. I'd rock that bag all day long. Would you rock? I, 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 